Uh, Alma, do you want to stop the recording? Done. Are you ready? It's recording. Perfect, thanks. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to have uh, two of our internal speakers uh, to come and talk about federated learning in heterogeneous environments, um, which is going to be presented by Jose Luis Ambedi and Dimitris Tripolis. Um, so Jose Luis is an associate research professor of computer science and a research team leader at ISI. Uh, he's an expert on information integration, including query writing under constraints, learning schema mappings, and entity linkage. His current research is on biomedical data science, developing novel approaches for integration and analysis of biomedical and genetic data with several large NIH-funded projects, including efficient federated learning for biomedical domains. And he'll be uh, speaking with Dimitris Tripolis, who is a PhD candidate in computer science at USC. Uh, Dimitri holds a BS in computer science from the Athens University of Economics and Business and a master degree in computer science with a data science specialization from USC. And his research focus on uh, federated learning, federated data management system and data integration. So just a couple of reminders for this talk. If you're a panelist and you have questions, please post them in the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask live. If you're an attendee, please use the Q&A box. And without further ado, uh, Dimitri and Jose Luis. Uh, thank you, Deborah. So let me share my screen. Okay, it's taking a second. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, so we're, today we're going to, so thank you, Deborah, for the nice introduction. Um, so I actually have worked a lot on information integration, uh, but it turns out that in many domains, actually integrating the data uh, into a single side where you can harmonize it and so on, it's actually quite hard. So I started working, and I'm working with Dimitri on this, on this question, can we learn from distributed data uh, respecting privacy? So the idea, I mean, people integrate data because they want to analyze it. So can you analyze the data without actually moving the data, and revealing private information about the data? And a uh, prototypical use case is uh, hospitals that want to share medical records. Uh, in this case, you want to protect the data and often hospitals wouldn't like the data to leave the premises, uh, but you still want to learn uh, jointly over all the available data at all the different sites, uh, but without moving the data. So is that possible? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, there's this uh, set of techniques called federated learning that allow you to learn a joint model from distributed data silos. And the idea is that no data is shared among the sources. Uh, the training is done locally, no data leaves the sites. Uh, the sources do share the parameters and um, we are, this can be done with different types of machine learning models, but we are learning neural networks. So we will share uh, some of the parameters of the neural network like the gradients or the weights of the network. Uh, the challenges are how do you do efficient learning? How do you respect the privacy, the security of the data? And often the data is heterogeneous. Or the environments are heterogeneous, uh, both in computational power. So we have some sites that have powerful cluster of GPUs, and other sites that have a small GPU, or even GPUs, CPUs, and also the heter statistical heterogeneity, like different data distribution of different sites. So one site could be a large hospital with lots of patients, the other site could be a small clinic with fewer patients, and they may see different uh, types of patients, maybe different diseases. Um, okay, so that's the, the setup. In a bit more detail, so we're trying to learn a uh, uh, joint uh, community model, a uh, uh, single neural network from distributed data silos. Uh, again, the training is, is down to the sources and the clients never share the data. They only share these parameters of the net of the weights. And the way the training goes is everybody, every side and goes over its local data set and it trades for a given period of time. And when they're done with a local training, they will share the parameters with a federation controller. Um, 
And the version controller will aggregate these locally trained models in some way. Generally, well, the simplest method and the most common method is some form of weighted average. So uh, you take all the model parameters and you average them with some weights um, to generate a community model. Once that community model is generated, then it's sent back to each of the learners and these uh, cycles continue. Uh, every, each of these cycles called a federation round of them. So this process repeats. Um, let me talk a little bit more about the different types of environments where this type of techniques, federated learning has been applied. And there are two main uh, environment, types of environments. One is called cross silo and one about cross device. So cross silo is when you have fewer sites, say the order of tens to hundreds, uh, in which every site has probably a lot of data, like a hospital. Um, this is applicable to um, companies that want to share data, hospitals, data centers, things like that. Um, and the primary bottleneck is the computation. Uh, there's also been a lot of work in a different environment, which is uh, sometimes called the cross-device environment. And that's for uh, the Internet of Things, so sensors, uh, also mobile devices. Um, so here the data, the, sorry, the sites can be less reliable. So the cell phone may be turned off, uh, while in the cross silo, generally the, data, the sites are always available and they have good internet connections and things like that. Um, uh, but in cross device, you're looking at a much, much larger number of devices. So it could be tens of thousands, uh, even millions, many millions. Um, and every data, every site may have only a little bit of data. Um, the solution here, what people often do is they sample a few clients at every round in order to move the learning forward. While in the cross silo uh, environment, generally you try to use all the sites at every person round. And there are different uh, bottlenecks. So in cross silo would be the computation, in the cross device would be communication and, and availability. So we've worked mostly on the cross silo uh, device, but I think most of the techniques that we discuss are also applicable to the cross device. Um, what our focus has been is in the heterogeneity of these environments. And the first type of heterogeneity is the statistical heterogeneity. So we consider that we different amounts of data per site or different this, that class, data distribution per site, for example, different classes per site, you can say different diseases at every hospital. Um, and here you see a representation that we will use in experiments later about that representation, that distribution of the data. Um, so the simpler case is when you have a data, the amount of data is uniform and the distribution is um, IID, independently identically distributed. And that means that, for example, here's an example with 10 classes per learner. So every site gets a representative sample of all the classes and they, say they get the same amount of data. So we call that uniform and IID. And this is generally an easier learning environment. Um, a harder environment is when each site only sees a subset, for example, we have a different data distribution. But for example, this is only a subset of the classes in this case. If there are 10 different classes, each site only gets three classes per learner. So if there was something like CIFAR 10, which is an imaging object recognition in images task, uh, maybe the first site only sees uh, you know, cars and dogs and ships, and the next site sees the birds and, and trucks and, um, and, and cats and so on. Or if it was diseases, then this hospital primarily focuses on this diseases and the other one focuses on a different type of diseases. And you can combine, of course, the data amount and the statistical distribution. So you can have something like this. In this case, non-IAD five means you see only five of the classes. So every site only sees five of the classes and they have a different amount of data. This is skewed data distribution in the amount of data. And you can have very, very skewed distribution like this uh, power law distribution. And this power law, uh, we run experiments on it to, to kind of mimic or to, to bring the idea of the long tail of science, that you may have some sites with a lot of data and many, many, many sites with a little bit of data. So we wanted to, to, to understand how these training algorithms in these environments work. Um, in addition to the statistical heterogeneity, you may also have the system of computational heterogeneity. So some, some sites may have uh, different types of GPUs, TPUs, GPUs, CPUs, PGAs. They will have different computational power that we're able to process the models uh, much faster than others. And what happens is with the different, uh, this heterogeneous computation, you're going to have strugglers. So you may have some sites that uh, are able to compute a lot more work in, in less time and other ones that will take a lot, a lot longer to compute the same amount of work. 
So here's some experiments that we ran with very heterogeneous sites. Some, some of the sites are GPUs and there was a CPUs, so they're about 10 times faster, uh, the GPUs and the CPUs. And you can see here that if you, in some protocols, on the training protocols, you say everybody has to do like four epochs uh, of training in the, in the neural network. Um, so if you, the GPUs are, are basically idle most of the time because they're waiting for the CPUs. So you have a type of protocol that everybody needs to do the same amount of work of epochs, then you will have very bad underutilization of the resources. Okay, so not to bury the lead, why do we want to do federated learning? And, and the bottom line is that the federation, the model that can be achieved by the federation outperforms any single silo or, or client or site. Uh, these are some experiments that we run in a particular neuroimaging domain that we'll discuss in more detail later, but it's called brain age, and it's about predicting the age of a human brain from MRI scans of the brain. And it's a neural network, a convolution, five layer convolutional network. And, and here's a simple environment because everybody has the same amount of data and it's an equal distribution, I distribution. And here on the right, you can see the distribution of the data. So this is ages of people, the 20 to the age, and every site has the same age distribution approximately, and everybody has also approximately the same amount of data. But in this simple environment, you can see that any single site can only achieve uh, an error rate of about 3.8 or something like that. Um, here, lower is better. This is the, the mean absolute error. Um, but the federated model, the one that is doing this federated training, um, can achieve a much better error rate, much lower error rate. Um, and if you have a more uh, a harder domain, more heterogeneous domain, in this case, uh, we have different amounts of data per site and different data distributions per site. So this site has mostly older people, this has a bit younger people, this is more over, all over. Uh, in these situations, you can have arbitrarily bad sites. And even in the best site, the one that has the most data, it still doesn't achieve the same quality or error rate than the federated uh, model. And, and here are different reasons why one site can be uh, have a very bad um, uh, accuracy predicting this this class. So this is being tested over the whole distribution. This is what you learn. You want to learn brain age over a range of uh, ages. So if you have a little bit of data like learner eight and, and a kind of uh, uh, skewed distribution, or basically a younger distribution, uh, you are going to do kind of terrible predicting this. But the federation will deal with the heterogeneity and produce a better model. And some of you may be thinking, well, you have many sites, can you do something like an ensemble solution? So we also tried um, with ensembles in which every site kind of trains locally, and then there's a combination rule that will um, try to ensemble the local models in a more classical way. And we tried different type of ensemble uh, weighting functions, like either equally weighted or weighted by the number of training examples. That is a proxy for maybe how good the data or the quality of the model from that site is going to be. Or the square root. And here in the experimental results, you can see that the federated model, which is this uh, blue line, is always better than what the ensembles produce across pretty much all the different uh, domains. So here the y-axis fashion round, so you let the network train for a while uh, to improve their uh, models. And you see that the final accuracy in, in the, in the federated uh, learning approach is better than ensembles. So now that hopefully I convinced you that further learning is a useful technique, uh, Dimitri is going to describe a uh, different type of training methods for this further learning. So you can take it over and you can tell me when to change the slides. Sure. So the further learning optimization problem can be decoupled into global and local. Uh, the global optimization is, is when we aggregate uh, the locally trained models from the different from the participating learners. And the way is that we try to optimize the global optimization function by taking a weight aggregation over the local objective function of every learner. The way that every local model is being weighted into the federation, uh, the original approach was based on the number of examples. And this is denoted with uh, the lowercase p um, uh, k in the above in the in the equation on the top. Uh, the results of the normalization factor, which is of course the summation of all these contribution values. However, this is the global aggregation, which happens at the controller end. Uh, on the other end, there is the local optimization objective, which is actually how every learner trains the model, the community model on its local data set. 
In the original work, uh, there was used vanilla stochastic gradient descent. However, recently there was proposed momentum stochastic gradient descent, which actually was shown to have accelerated convergence compared to vanilla stochastic gradient descent. And more recently was FedProx, which actually introduces a regularization term in the local objective function, which is actually denoting the deviation of the local model from the community model. And this is denoted uh, on, the, on the right side by WT minus WC. And there is also this, uh, there is also the proximal term is actually the, the mu factor. And this controls how much you want to penalize the local model from deviating from the community model. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of training protocols, uh, there was proposed originally the synchronous pro protocol was the or was proposed in the original work. However, uh, recently the asynchronous protocol was also proposed, and in our work we also proposed the semi-synchronous. Coming to place, uh, semi-synchronous is actually the protocol where we let every learner train locally for a specific predefined number of local steps, defined in terms of uh, epochs, and then the controller aggregates all the locally trained models in order to compute the community model. This is can be denoted with timestamp T1 at the, uh, at the top left uh, uh, plot. Then in the asynchronous protocol, the difference, the difference is that every learner requests triggers a community update request whenever it computes its local uh, training. So an, a community model is being computed every time a learner completes local, a local training task, and then and there is no synchronization point. However, both of these approaches have some uh, limitations. In the, in the approach, in the case of the synchronous, we have some idle time that is incurred by the slow learners to the fast learners. In particular, assuming that L1 is a fast learner, you can see that there's some idle time until it reaches until L3, which is actually a slow learner, completes its local training task. So there's some idle time incurred in this in the federation round. In the case of the asynchronous protocol, there is a case that some of the learners are actually being trained on a community model that is stale. So basically, they are working on a model that is older than the most recent community model. In order to alleviate these two limitations, we propose a semi-sequence protocol, which basically saying that we allow every learner to, com to continue training up to a predefined time interval or timestamp. And so, for instance, this can, be this can be seen with the green arrow at the top where we don't, there's no idle time for the fast learner, but rather the fast learner continues training until the slow learner R3 completes its local training task. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a visualization to show the actual limitations that, that uh, can be seen in the Federation. Uh, as we have seen earlier, there is this resource utilization that happens during the synchronous execution. So basically, on the left side, we can see uh, the active and the idle time between the different processors. On the, on the, top, on the top five is the CPUs and bottom five are GPUs. Uh, the, the green boxes are actually showing the active time that and there is, uh, the resources, uh, every of the processor is devoting to the training, whereas idle time is when one of there's uh, whenever one of the processors is waiting for the other processors to finish. As you can see, when you have the synchronous protocol, the GPUs are actually being heavily underutilized. Whereas in the semi-sync approach, where we let everyone, all the processors to continue training, then most of the time, all the uh, processors are being active. In, in the case of the asynchronous protocol, uh, as we discussed a bit earlier, is actually the, uh, regarding the staleness. So staleness in, is incurred when one of the learners is being trained, is actually training on a model, on a community model that is older than the most recent community model. And in the case when you have a federation that is consists of GPUs and CPUs, the GPUs has, are less stale compared to the CPUs since they update the community model more frequently. And this can be noted by the staleness, of the, the staleness in terms of steps and in terms of the timestamps. Uh, here we show we show the diagram based on the steps. So basically, how many how many how many number of steps or train, local local training steps have been committed to the community model? In our approach, the semi-synchronous protocol, uh, we allow every learner to train up the specific uh, synchronization point, and basically, what this uh, allows us actually to oversample the data from the uh, from the from the uh, from the fast learners. And this actually experimentally, we can show that it works a bit better. Um, then in terms of the mixing strategies, we have the global, uh, again, we have the original work with the federate average. So basically every learner trains on local model using vanilla stochastic gradient descent and the controller is responsible to aggregate these local models based on the number of examples that every uh, learner was used to train the community model. Uh, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a policy that can be used both with synchronous protocol and the semi-synchronous protocol. Then there's a proximity, which we call it, uh, 
uh, which is a fed prox, which actually the aggregation rule at the controller end is, uh, is still the weighted function is based on the number of examples that its learner used to train it locally. Uh, it's the community model and basically federated average. And in terms of the local is the penalization that uh, uses an, a penalization term or regularization term uh, when updating the local model and then and sending the model back to the controller. Then in the asynchronous, uh, in the asynchronous case, there is also uh, there are two different approaches. The, the one that we propose is called FEDREC, Fed Recency, that is based on the number of steps. And there is one other approach that's called FedAsync, that is based on the number of uh, that is based on the contributing time between uh, two community updates. So in order to be more uh, in principle, basically FedAsync, what it does, it actually penalizes models that are more stale, uh, penalizes learners local models to the community that are more stale but basic but cap by capturing the number of update requests that occurred between two subsequent two consecutive uh community update requests whereas in our case with fed recency because of the uh unbalances that exist across the learners in terms of number of number of examples and in terms of uh the resources capability we are actually capturing the stainless based on the number of steps that were performed between two uh consecutive community uh models Okay, so so now we've described kind of briefly some some of the training policies and the, and the different trade-offs and training, um, and now we're going to some some experimental results. I should mention that the federated average uh, approach was this was so this federated learning methodology was introduced by Google in kind of circa 2015 16. Uh, and this is the average uh, approach is, is kind of the original approach. Um, so we're going to compare against these all different training policies and some that we have developed. Um, so these are results on the CIFAR 10 kind of benchmark, which is an imaging benchmark of recognizing objects in, in images like dogs, cats, trucks, ships, birds, and things like that. And and there are different types of uh, distributions. And these first results are on a homogeneously homogeneous environment. So what they are all GPUs, the only thing that changes is the amount of data. So every learner still takes slightly bit different of time because they have different amount of data, but they are all the same kind of type of GPU. Uh, so even in this simple domain, you can still see that the protocol, training protocol that you use uh, impacts uh, learning convergence uh, significantly in some cases. Um, so here, the dashed lines, uh, well, the blue lines, the DAS or solid are our semi sig method with different parameters. And you can see that in general, they are the faster convergers, uh, convergence for all the, in all the environments. And something interesting that the original kind of Google method, the federal average uh, with vanilla ICT, it fails to, to learn in, in some of the hard domains like these power law domains. Um, so that's a kind of an interesting observation. If you go to more complicated domains that are heterogeneous, uh, both in data and computationally. So here we are, we are kind of uh, alternating uh, CPUs and GPUs, so fast and slow learners. Um, you can see that it's still our kind of semi-sync approach, which is a simple idea, just kind of everybody trains for a given amount of time and the fast learners are able to do more epochs and the, or, or batches and the slow learners do less batches. Uh, but that helps to increase the convergence of the variation quite significantly, as we can see here. And generally, they, sometimes they also achieve, you know, a final, a final better accuracy than other methods. And here we're comparing both against the kind of synchronous methods and asynchronous methods that in the previous literature, and um, with the same effect as before. That in some of these hard uh, situations, some of the previous methods just completely fail to learn, or or they would take a, a extremely long time to learn. So here the x-axis is actually parallel processing time. So how long it takes for the federation to reach a global model of a given accuracy. Um, and, and our methods um, seem to be more efficient, or at least converge much quicker. Um, the same results on CIFAR 10, but with uh, heterogeneous uh, with communication cost. So this was the actual power person time, so the work of time. This is the number of federation rounds. Um, so our semi-sync approach also is able to converge faster with three efficient runs than, than previous approaches. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything else on that, Dimitri. Just the lambda is the communication frequency, uh, the lambda factor. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, so here we still need results for only one lambda, but this lambda basically tells you how often do you communicate, and we'll show more results later on the impact of, of lambda. Um, okay, so, 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 yes. Okay, quick question for you in, in the chat. Uh, the question is, can these learners help each other through learning? I mean, while one learner is done and others are still learning, can we gain any valuable information from the first learner's weights? Does it conflict with confidentiality? Yeah, so actually, I didn't kind of explain that maybe very well. So, so yeah, they're, they're actually helping each other all the time. So when, when a, learner, a learner learns locally and gets a neural network with a given set of parameters, set of weights in the network, uh, and every learner does the same thing, or we use local set, then they share it with this version controller. The version controller creates this community model that is this average, weighted average of the different learners. So in a sense, every time you create a community model and that community model is sent back to each of the, log the individual trainers. So that community model in a sense embodies or captures in these average weights, these kind of mixed uh, weights, the knowledge that the other learners have been acquiring. So this is happening all the time. So you're basically mixing the models of all the learners like all the time at every round. I hope that answers that question. We will come back a little bit more to that, but that's, um, that's really what's happening. So we are, we are mixing the models all the time. Uh, so they're helping each other all, all the time. Okay, I see that Keith Reese raised his hand. So maybe you can ask or? Yes, hi, Jose Luis. Um, uh, one question I have though, is you're making an assumption that everyone is uh, uh, in this whole training uh, process, uh, not leaving and no new people are entering. And it, I would expect in uh, many, uh, realistic scenarios, uh, you're going to get, um, especially for devices, new people entering and exiting. And it makes me wonder, uh, would that inherently uh, bias the people who stick around? Uh, would it would it overtrain on those people who are sticking around um, and therefore make uh, poor models for those people or, or their, their data gets overused? So, so that's an interesting question. And, uh, and the answer is, is yes. And even in, with our semi-sync strategy, the fast learners, you know, gets, you know, in a sense, get also overrepresented. However, because of the model mixing, things are actually okay at the global level. So we haven't done testing experiments with very, very large changes on, on the numbers of agents coming in and out. So we assume that, so, so in the experiments that we've done, I think we're okay. And as I can show some, I'll show at the end some, some results on, on that, that even in some, in such situations in which it, it, it seems that it will oversample, actually, maybe I can maybe I can do that very quickly. So this is a bit scary. Okay, so here's a situation that we analyze in which it looks that um, it wouldn't learn very well because you have most of the data in the slow learners and very little data in the fast learners. So you would think that that will completely make a, a very hard learning problem, and and you will get a very hard representation from this very fast learners that are overly represented, but they have very little data. Um, so even in situations where you have non iid data and a power law, you can see that this kind of semi-sync is still is much better, uh, better, better convergence and final quality than traditional methods like sync threaded average. But yeah, this is a, a question we haven't fully explored. Um, I, we focus in, in, in somehow more stable domains in which we don't expect uh, wide fluctuations of the data. We, or we, at least we expect that maybe the data distributions from its side over, over an average across all the different learners coming in and going is still somewhat stable. Okay, I see more raised hands, maybe uh, Karan, or I don't know who's next. So there's a question in the Q&A. What if we have many learners, but each learner's data is not enough to learn a good enough model? Do you have any suggestions of what to do in these cases to be comparable with a centralized model? Yeah, that's also a very good question. That happens in your imaging cases that we will uh, describe later. Um, so in that case, if you have very, very little data, um, the, our current, the current approach that we are kind of investigating is using some domain transfer. So basically you can pre-train the models and are supposed to start training from scratch from these really kind of, I don't know, 50 examples that you have that is not going to be good to learn any, any model with high accuracy that we will pre-train on a, a separate data set 
and transfer and then learn over, over transfer data. So that, that's what our current approach is. And we are, I don't have results on that right now, but that's what we think it will work well. I, I'm happy to hear other suggestions, by the way. Um, much of this task, this talk is on, on current work. Um, so many, a lot of it is not quite published. It's kind of under review. Uh, so I, I welcome comments from the audience and suggestions. Any other questions? Uh, I think Karen had his hands up. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sure whether it's a relevant question or not, since I don't really know too much about machine learning. But I was curious, like this approach that you're doing, how does this compare to, you know, Optuna, like, which is uh, gaining popularity for uh, hyperparameter optimization? Um, it, um, applicable i don't know like i was just curious if you knew about optimal yeah. so i don't i don't know about the particular system um, um, send me a pointer but but uh, hyperparameter optimization does matter uh, we have some results later in which we so in in all these results that we're going to show actually we fix the hyperparameters of the neural network at the beginning and we don't change them uh, we've done experiments changing learning rate and changing this lambda factor for this semi sync um, and it does make a difference. Um, so they are, that's kind of in our current work of uh, trying different kind of hyperparameter schedules or, or yeah, schedules to see if we can improve either the, the convergence rate or the final accuracy. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I can share the link, but uh, yeah, I, do, do, send, do send me the link. But uh, I mean, I we're not talking about this also. You, I'm yeah. not going to show the slides, but I'm going to the slides. So, so here is, for example, the effect of this lambda parameter. It has to do how often the, the, the sites communicate. And it can make a pretty big difference on the convergence rate. So if you communicate a lot, then you can converge much faster, uh, but you incur a lot of communication. So it's a trade-off between how much, how expensive communication is versus local computation. So do you want to, if communication is cheap because you have very fast networks and you don't mind sharing these models, then generally sharing quickly makes you come uh, increases the convergence rate quite 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 fast and it's not it's not linear for example here you only take a little bit longer in, in reaching convergence but we too many it's about how uh, but here you take like four times and and you still don't get much better so so it's an interesting uh, yeah, it, you know what might be possible is like you could maybe layer your work on top of Optuna, but uh, I that, that would be great. I, I, I'd like to learn more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. A any more questions or should I continue? Uh, yes, there's one more. What about okay. noise in different data sites? Some sites might have a smaller amount of data, but they might be reliable as compared to a larger noisy site. How would it affect the learning paradigm? Okay, so we have done some work that we didn't include in this talk, but I answer that. So we have a way, and, and we have an archive paper, I mean, there's an archive, in actually measuring the quality of its site. So, so the renal kind of Google algorithm, for the average, uh, they kind of have a proxy to measure the quality of a site, which is a number of examples. They assume that the quality of your, of your site is going to be proportional to how many examples you have learned. And that's why they wait in this federated average, the synchronous rate average, they weight the, its local model by the number of examples of the site. And that makes a difference in these kind of distributed, uh, I mean, uh, skewed pattern distributions of our law. Um, so we actually developed a different, a different system, a different training policy that we have not included here, uh, which is, uh, well, it's called performance weighting or distributed validation weighting, in which we create a distributed validation data set. And I'm supposed to use a proxy for the quality of um, of a model from a site, we actually measure in the validation data set uh, the quality of that site, and we weight the models accordingly. So that's that's one way, and that can help you to detect uh, detect uh, corrupted sites or, or sites with problems or sites of different quality. Um, so I, I won't talk much more about that in this talk, but we have some work. We have done some work on, on that. Okay, let, let me continue because I think otherwise we, we run out of time. Okay, so, so I told you that we can have fastest convergence, uh, but also has a, another benefit, which is the energy that you spent in each side. So here are some, weird, 
some kind of results that we did on energy efficiency um, and what's the energy required to achieve a given accuracy. So on a different environment. So this is, uh, and we choose this accuracy. So this is accuracy of 0.75. We choose this threshold of accuracy, basically that, uh, making sure that most of the different um, training policies would reach this accuracy. Sometimes it, it was too low because none of them didn't, didn't get reached there. But anyway, for these different um, uh, environments, uh, IID, non-IID, skewed, reading from power law, and different levels of accuracy, we computed how long it would take, well, what was the energy that was spent in achieving that accuracy? And the energy was really how long the CPUs or the GPUs were actually computing. And we took a simple estimation of the cost of a GPU with a CPU, which was the energy that they spent computing. And based on some results, it seems that thermal design power is a good proxy for the energy cost. And about GPUs are about twice as expensive as CPUs, at least in, in, in this kind of, uh, reference. And if you take it into account and you add up all the time that the GPUs and the CPUs were actually running, so it's kind of a conservative estimate because maybe you have to have them on all the time whether they're running or not, but we only take into account the time they're actually running, then you can get uh, you can get that the training policy, in this case, or semi-sync training policy, can be up to nine times more energy efficient than kind of the baseline, which would be the kind of synchronous, synchronous credit um, uh, average with vanilla HD. And in different domains, it would be between, uh, between 3.3 and, and nine. So that's kind of interesting. And I think this would be more interesting when we go to kind of IoT or, or sensors, because those will be much more sensitive to the amount of uh, energy that needs to be spent. Okay, so I saw examples in a simple, simple domain, which is CIFAR 10. So this calls in harder domains like CIFAR 100. Again, this is processing time. The blue line is a semi-sync with a good parameter. In this case, it's 0 0.5. So these are very large models. Uh, so it, it's a bit better to, to not to start sharing even if you, so this lambda 0 0.5 means that you are sharing. Uh, so you take the time that it would take to the slowest learner to learn, to go through a whole epoch. And this is half that time, uh, which means that uh, the slow learners don't go through a whole epoch when they process, but the fast learners may go through several epochs. Uh, but that particular uh, parameter uh, shows higher, much faster convergence and higher accuracy at least during this time, and also less communication rounds than other approaches. And similarly for another, and well, like these a hundred classes, uh, uh, sorry, hundred classes. And, and here you can see that these are even in the non-IID cases with only 50 classes per, per site. And we also run experiments with extended MNIST, which is 62 classes, and either both in skewed and non-IID, so 50 classes per learner only, uh, or IID with a power law. Uh, you can see that this kind of method is still um, outperforms others. And in general, there's a difference with the type of training policy that you choose. And depending on, this, on the domain and the environment, then you will have different strategies that will work better. But this semi-sync strategy seems to work quite well over many different domains. So to summarize, we look at this kind of synchronous, asynchronous, and semi-synchronous domains. And here you have the processing cost in synchronous um, could be high, the communication is, is, low, is, is, is low. The energy cost ends up being high because it takes a long time to converge. Um, um, you have under utilization of resources because there are things idle, like sites are idle, uh, but it's not a stale. So all the models are, are you're always doing a community model over the latest kind of uh, data from each of the uh, sites. The synchronous it has kind of complementary properties, it's lower cost, uh, high, more higher communication, medium energy cost, there's nothing idle, everything's always computing, uh, but you get the stale models to get. Sometimes the model has been operating as a model that was generated like you know, five minutes ago, things like that. And semi signals is like a good compromise on these different, uh, different uh, dimensions. Okay, so now we have done quite a bit of work uh, in our collaboration with uh, Paul Thompson uh, in neuroimaging. Um, and I'm going to describe that.
Sorry about that. Okay, so it turns out that um, research studies in, uh, in my, my med biology and medicine and many other domains are often naturally distributed. You have many sites that are kind of uh, aggregating all the data sets, but they have problems kind of uh, sharing all the data. So they are a prime application of related learning approaches. And here are three data sets that we are looking at. Uh, one is apnea, which is an Alzheimer's disease, neuroimaging data set. So we're looking particularly neuroimaging data sets. So apnea is for Alzheimer's disease. And the biobank is a very large genetic study and has clinical data and genetic data and also MRI data. So the whole UK building is about 500,000 individuals and they have about 40,000 individuals with MRIs, which is a very large data set in general. These other studies like ACNI is a smaller, about 2,000 subjects. Uh, another very large uh, study of which uh, Paul Thompson, which is at UC, is at PI, is Enigma, and it's also a very, very large study with sites all over the world. Um, but the analysis that they do is all through meta-analysis. So they don't share data, but they would share some statistics, generally some simple statistics like uh, uh, linear regression coefficients uh, to do meta-analysis and simple statistics. So we've been looking at, at these uh, neuroimaging problems and we have a set of neuroimaging tasks uh, by increasing difficulty. Uh, so the first one that we study is called brain age and is to predict the age of a subject based on the brain MRI. And this is a good um, kind of, we want to use a, a biomarker. So I guess the biologists want to use a biomarker. So if, if your brain, if we can get a good model to predict brain age and your brain looks uh, much older than your actual chronological age, maybe it's a good marker that you have a, a neuro, neurological disease. Or similarly, maybe you have a, a younger brain and you're going to be in, in good shape. Um, the next um, task by all the difficulty is uh, Alzheimer prediction, Alzheimer disease prediction from MRI. Uh, Parkinson prediction is, is harder. Uh, Alzheimer has more widespread effects on the brain. Parkinson is harder to detect. And the hardest of all is to do imaging and genetics. So try to associate genetic variation uh, and, and brain imaging and use MRIs to predict genetic variants or find out the effects of particular genes or, or uh, genetic variation signal nucleotide polymorphisms are localized in different brain regions. So we have started that with brain age and we are now currently doing Alzheimer's and Parkinson prediction. Um, and again, all this is joint work with Paul Thompson uh, and members of this group, Nikhil Tinagar and Pratipan. Um, so for brain age, again, the goal is to, to predict the age of a human brain. The state of the art is able to predict the age with a plus minus three years. And they've been exploring different type of neural architectures, CNN, Celestians, attention-based neural models. And we've been done experiments on the federated setting to apply to Enigma, uh, but mod simulating that using partitions of the UK Viola Bank data that we have. And then we also done experiments on, uh, we will talk later that we have, all this is done in a secure environment and, and we have experiments on, on the effects of encryption on this. So the experiments I'm going to see is with this type of uh, convolutional neural network. So we've simulated, or we've partitioned the data from the UK Bank in different type of uh, distributions like uniform ID, uniform non-ID. Here you see that everybody has the same kind of data distribution, different data distributions, and now different data amounts and different data distributions. And for the skewed and IID, uh, this red line is the performance of the centralized model. And you can see that the um, neural, the federated learning approach can, under some training policies and some parameters, can essentially reach the same performance as the centralized model. So this is kind of encouraging. However, if you go to harder domains like uh, skewed distributions, neural line distributions, there's still a gap on what you can achieve through, if you could pull all the data in a single set together, the centralized model versus what the different training policies can, can achieve. And the same holds kind of in, in terms of communication of personal bonds. Okay, so we've shown you why pleasant learning is interesting. In general, you can achieve uh, a, better, a better solution than uh, previous approaches or, or training on your own local data. Um, under some conditions, you can achieve the same performance of, of, of the, as the centralized data, and you can achieve uh, high com fast convergence and energy efficiency. Um, but in order, the premise of all this uh, work is that you can really protect the data. So the premise of some previously had not been done under encryption, but we have also recently incorporated 
um, strong homomorphic encryption into architecture so that all the learning is, is, is secure in a strong way. And I think now Dimitri will tell us how this works. And this is a gym work with uh, Sivatsan Ravi, which is at ISI, Mohammed David, which is a US single science, and their PhD and other you know, students. So uh, at the beginning of the federation round, the controller, so everything runs encrypted. So uh, the transmission layer between the learners and the controller is uh, an encrypted layer. And similar, the controller is working on encrypted models. And the, the weighted aggregation of the local models is also encrypted. In order, the pipeline in order to take place uh, at the beginning of every federation round, every learner receives an encrypted community model, which is denoted as a ciphertext uh, encrypted. Uh, so basically, the, the community model is encrypted, the, the, the learners receive the encrypted model, they use their private key in order to decrypt the model, and then continue training on the unencrypted model on their local data set. And upon the completion of the local training, they encrypt the local model using uh, the public key, and then the set which generates a new ciphertext, which is being sent directly to the Federation Controller. This happens across all the participating learners in parallel. And so, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, this pipeline can be denoted with numbers one and two. And then the, th uh, the number three it denotes the transmission of the encrypted local model to the controller, which actually is responsible to aggregate the encrypted, mod the encrypted models and perform the encrypted aggregation, which is uh, uh, denoted with number, five, number uh, four. And the other one, so there are two things that we sent from the learners to the controller is the encrypted model and the scaling factor. Scaling factor is the number is how much is the contribution of the of the local model of every letter into the community. Uh, next slide, please. And by performing in this in this environment, we explore whether by applying encryption and with and without encryption, we see any performance degradation uh, during federation training. By apply, after applying the CKKS uh, construction scheme, which is uh, referred to Cheon Kim Kim Song, uh, which the original authors, uh, we can see that even even when employing encryption, we don't see any performance degradation or penalization in the federated model. And by evaluating the federated training into uniform and skewed, online and skewed environments, uh, we can see that the encrypted model actually uh, re returns the same results in the same accuracy as the original model without encryption, and in some cases actually performs a little bit better compared to the vanilla federated average without encryption. Uh, we attribute this some minor optimality uh, because of the precision uh, and uh, numerical uh, stability that needs to happen during encoding, decoding, and uh, private weighted aggregation. And But we're still exploring into, to understand a bit, a bit better this effect. This can be, you know, this can be seen in the SQNO95, SQNO93 environments. Yeah, we Next think time. that there's a bit of a regularization effect that happens because there's a bit of approximation in, in the description that we haven't explored fully. Yes. And this is actually similar when we apply to the brain age. So again, in this, uh, as, as you can see, uh, when we apply federated average without encryption and federated average with encryption, uh, the performance of the federated models was identical to uh, the original federated average. And whereas, however, when we go to the student on ID, we can see that this approximation of the precision uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the floating numbers can actually result in a bit better optimal uh, fe uh, federated uh, error. The what also a very interesting uh, takeaway here is actually, as you can see, when we go from uniform IID to non IID and skew non IID, the performance of the federated model, uh, federated model degrades. So in the uniform IID you have 2.8, then in the uniform non IID you go close the the test uh, mean absolute error is close to three, and when we do skewed non IID the uh, the test error is 3.2, close to 3.2. Uh, but bottom line, the takeaway is that. Uh, applying encryption in during, fed, during federated training doesn't actually hurt the performance of the federated model. Okay, so so just to wrap up, um, most of the work that we have presented actually has been funded under the DARPA Cooperative Secure Learning Program that actually com has more components that we've described and there are a number of people involved that I'll, I'll show next. But this is um, a whole architecture in which we're looking at again federated learning on heterogeneous environments, and they have several security and privacy methods. And I just want to mention, of course, data is never shared. Model parameters are aggregated over many batches, so that's protected data. Uh, the community model mixes the local models, so it's even harder to attribute the data. However, you can still attack those models if you get a hold of them. However, under 
homomorphic encryption, uh, when things are encrypted, it will be hard to attack. Those are very secure uh, methods. That, so they, even if the controller is compromised, it only operates on secure uh, encrypted models. And I want, and there's another strategy that we are exploring. Uh, this is led by Rayford Steg and his students, in which we can also add particular information theoretic uh, um, constraints that eliminate leaks from protected attributes. Um, um, we should talk to Greg if you want more information about that. Um, we also, in this work, we've been assuming honest but curious models and, and working on new imaging, but the architecture is general. So let me just give a quick shout out to everybody involved in this project. So Dimitri and I have developed in the, the training policies and the core architecture. And uh, then uh, Mohammed Navid, Sebastian Ravi, and, and their students are doing all the encryption. Uh, and then Greg Kristek and, and his students, other students are working on this uh, information theoretic protections. And a lot of the neuroimaging work has been done in Paul Thompson's uh, imaging genetic centers um, uh, with Nikhil uh, Dinagar and a previous uh, co-worker called Prati Plum. Um, so that said, these are our next steps. So we're looking at additional methods for optimizing the person training. We're looking at novel aggregation functions beyond this weighted average. Uh, as somebody mentioned in the talk, I already asked about, we're looking at different ways of optimizing the hyperparameters, different schedules of optimization, um, different combinations of local and global optimizers and regularization. Uh, we are, of course, very, very interested in preserving privacy. So that's all this work that uh, Greg Restek is leading on information theory guarantees for federal learning and avoiding, uh, again, identifying a single individual is, is very hard, but you can do something that's called membership attacks in which you can find, if you have some information of one individual, you can find if that individual are participating in a study. And, and that's, in biomedical domains, that's important because for example, if it was a study of something like a mental disorder, you wouldn't like some party that has some information about you uh, to learn that you participate in a given study on schizophrenia or something like that. But there are strong guarantees that, uh, I guess Greg Perestag is, is looking at to, to prevent those type of uh, leakage. Um, the, we have some experiments with the CKKS scheme There are many other uh, fully and partially homomorphic encryption schemes that uh, Robin David and Sebastian Ravi are looking at. And we have some experiments there and they will come to architecture soon. Uh, we're also interested in, in robust federal learning. So what happens if they are corrupted or poor quality or malicious data sources? So we have some ongoing work on that. And then we plan to continue in these biomedical domains, particularly neuroimaging with additional private learning models, uh, this uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer, Alzheimer's and Parkinson prediction, and eventually with a goal to deploy over the Nichman consortium. And recently we're looking at lifelong federal learning, which is a new thing, and that's with Shanghai and Mohammed Rustami. And I should announce that the, the whole federal learning framework will be released open source, hopefully now in default. I think, I think that's it. I don't know if there are any more questions. Well, thank you, Jose Luis and Dimitri for a great talk. Uh, two more questions for you in the Q&A. So the first one is, what is the advantage of encrypting the model and having a uh, FL framework as opposed to having simply encryption on data? So I missed the last part. So encrypting uh, the, the whole the model versus? Uh, versus a simple encryption on the data. Well, so you cannot just, I mean, I'm not necessarily what you mean by a simple encryption on the data, but you cannot just do a simple encryption of data. So in order for the, so every learner is really has like a TensorFlow instance and you have to decrypt the model to train generally. I mean, you could try to train encryptedly, but that's, uh, that generally is much slower and has other issues. But so when they train the, the model, the learner, the side trains locally before it sends that model to anybody to prevent this kind of membership attacks and all this kind of possible information leakage from the data inside the, the side, you encrypt it. So when you encrypt it, that model, you send to the definition controller. The definition controller gets all these encrypted models from the different sites, but it, it still needs to do this, this aggregation operation. It has to mix these models and there's some function. And the, ones we've, the one we've shown is this weighted average. So, it will have to decrypt them, but then the version controller will be a weak point 
if we decrypted the models at the operation controller level, because then they could be attacked, they could do these membership attacks. So to prevent that, even if the operation controller is compromised, you can perform this weighted average under encryption, and that is homomorphic encryption techniques that allow to do that computation in the encrypted space. So the fashion controller, even if you've got compromise, it, you can never learn anything about the models and perform like this, homomorphic, uh, these uh, membership attacks, for example. I hope that answers the question, but that's, that's the reason to do it all encrypted. Yeah, let me know in the Q&A if it ends up the question. Uh, and then the second question I have is, oh, uh, the qualifier is, I mean, not even having a FL model at all. Sorry, what's the other one? So it's not the other one. It's like a qualifier from the, the answer that you just gave. Like what's, uh, what's the advantage of having the FL framework versus not having it at all? Yeah, well, so so what would you, how would you learn over all the data? So that's what we tried to answer at the very beginning, that you could try to do an, an ensemble or something like that. Uh, but in general, here's what happens. So yeah, you can try local, try to learn locally over your data, but since the other, data, the other sites are not going to send you the data, then you can only achieve some level of performance. But the federated learning approach will achieve a much better performance, learning performance. In this case, lower error, better accuracy, and so on. And that happens regardless if you have like a nice environment which all the sites are similar or a heterogeneous environment. So you always get a better performance on the federated learning. Uh, same, same with ensemble. So these were the kind of ensemble techniques that we tried. So, so yeah, you want to do federated learning if you cannot get all the data in a single site in which you can apply the, the, the analysis centralized if you want to protect the data at its different location. All right, any other questions? And everybody, please, you can, my, our emails are there. If you have any more questions you want to follow up, please send me an email, send us an email. We're happy to, to talk more. Well, thank you again, Jose Luis and Dimitri for a great talk. And yes, you know where to find them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody.